<laughs> Tonight, I have the great pleasure and to introduce to you one, if not the, role model for all of you, a guy who called himself a street philosopher and still has conquered academia, <laughs> teaching all over the world. Every day I get another invitation in my email for him, not for me, for him. <laughs> <laughs> but he certainly deserves it. He did, started as a filmmaker as far as I recall, it's a long time ago. Then he <coughs> discovered architecture as a very worthy field of study. And as you know, architecture is one of our fields in this school, in this program. So we are not thinking that philosophy and architecture and media are kind of separated. They have to be brought together. Manuel de Landa did this very early on. And one of the reasons he is at Columbia University in the architecture uh, department. But his real, real importance for us is his reading and understanding of one of the key professors of our uh, program, Gilles Deleuze. And so he is invited to introduce you to his idea, his reading of Deleuze. And he gives us always much more than that. Because what good is, is to just repeat a dead philosopher. You have to bring him alive in your own thoughts, in your own theory. And that is what Manuel in all his books tries again. And it's not the Deleuze you have heard of, the anarchist, everything goes, rhythm, rhythm, rhythm everywhere. So it's a very realistic, even near to science uh, philosopher in his uh, understanding. And every year, fourth year now, he comes back and convinces us that this is the case. Reality exists, guy. <coughs> Don't believe you can erase it by fiction. So please welcome. Manuel Dilan. Thank you, Wolfman. <laughs> uh, speaking of Wolfs, I would like tonight to talk a little bit about Deleuze's fascination with animals. He always displayed a deep interest for ethology, the science of animal behavior and the study of animal behavior. And he was very serious in the way he took Nietzsche's warning against being human, all too human. For him, it was particularly for artists, one of the greatest dangers that an artist could fall into, to live only within the small provincial world of humanity. Not that there's not much to express about humanity, not that the humans don't have a really wide range of feelings and emotions to be expressed, not that humans have not a wide range of skills and capacities to perform this expressivity, but there is a danger of closing ourselves into ourselves, to believe that we are the crown jewel of evolution, to believe that we were meant by God to be what we are, to believe that we were, the, we were the chosen animals and we were giving this paradise to use whatever way we wanted to. Of course, we are living in periods where ecological crisis and global warming and other, effect, and other terrible consequences of our industrial behavior and our practices have woken us to the fact that we are not alone in this planet and that we, that we need to be the guides of this planet, not the owners and dirty owners of the planet. So the Lewis warned us over and over again against being human all too human. And that is one of the reasons why he studied very carefully non-human expressivity, and that is the subject of my talk today. I'm going to first give you, in a very rough summary, his theory of non-human expressivity. This is contained in a chapter of A Thousand Plateaus called The Geology of Morals. This is, of course, a play of words on the genealogy of morals of Nietzsche, but he takes, it's not just a metaphor. 
He's dealing with <laughs> geological uh, entities such as the Himalayas, the Rocky Mountains, any, any sedimentary rock formation when, when we see those bands of color running across the side of a mountain that has been blown apart to create a road. Any explosion, dramatic explosion of a volcano. The very movements of the tectonic plates that are invisible to us but are dramatically changing our landscape at very slow time scales but in the end reshaping our, 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 our earth. Geology for Deleuze was the beginning of non-human expressivity. I mean, all of us, when exposed to something like the Grand Canyon or even outside this building, when looking at the Alps and their magnificence, we're moved by that. And the moment we lose the capacity to be affected by those mountains, the moment we lose the capacity to be moved by those mountains, we lose something very important. And if we are artists, we lose, we lose something even more. Because that means that we are becoming now obsessed with the human world, with, with politics, not that that is unimportant, but if we become too concentrated on what is only too human, we lose sense of our otherness, of the real otherness, which is geology, chemistry, biology. So Deleuze's theory of expressivity in the geology of morals begins by saying, Everything, even inorganic creatures, express themselves. A crystal expresses its identity in its form, and in its way of interacting with light, and in its way of bouncing rays of light and refracting and reflecting rays of light. Regardless of whether there is a human holding this crystal and producing a rainbow, the very, a crystal itself could refract that white light, produce a rainbow, and express itself. Even atoms, in their humble being, express their identity. When an atom of hydrogen, or an atom of helium, or an atom of carbon interacts with radiation, it leaves a fingerprint of its identity in that radiation. Astrophysicists can then take photographs of that fingerprint and identify, for instance, whether a star that's too far away for us to examine it directly is made out of helium, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, simply by reading the fingerprints that those atoms leave in radiation. And those fingerprints identify every atom as an atom of a given species. In other words, they are expressions of the identity of the atoms. It's like as if an atom of hydrogen, an atom of hydrogen was crying out, I am hydrogen. Or an atom of helium was crying out, I am helium. Physicists can then, of course, use that expressivity, that information that atoms imprint as a fingerprint on, on radiation to identify them. But even without humans around, these inorganic entities were already expressing themselves. When we move beyond that to something like the coupled system hydrosphere, atmosphere, and it's, at least in this planet, it's endless variety of patterns. It's the constant emergence of tornadoes and hurricanes. The constant change of cloud formations with their own aesthetics and the different types of clouds, some more icy, some more fluffy, which are constantly changing that landscape in front of our own eyes. I mean, that, that skyscape in front of our own eyes and expressing part of what makes this planet unique. Other planets have atmospheres, but they, they are much more boring and routine. Ours changes every single day. And it gives us a way of admiring that expressivity of the planet itself. So Deleuze begins then with geology and crystals and says, non-human expressivity begins through, as a three-dimensional form of expressivity. It's in the very form of the crystals, in the very form of the mountains, in the very three-dimensional form of the clouds that we see their expression. It's a voluminous expression, as he says. The first great change in that expressivity was when three-dimensional expressivity became one-dimensional, when it lost two dimensions and became DNA. DNA, of course, stores information in a very real way, there's a code in DNA that is very real, it's not a metaphor.
There's a code in DNA that is very real, it's not a metaphor. Every triplet of particles that forms DNA, every triplet of nucleotides stands for, in the same way that a human code stands for something, a particular amino acid that will form a protein. And what in, in that chapter, Deleuze says, when three-dimensional expressivity becomes one-dimensional, it can now detach itself from the, from the specific form of a crystal, from the specific form, from a mountain, and begin generating all kinds of different forms, the different forms of living creatures. Because now you have a specialized line of expression, DNA. DNA, of course, makes possible the, the emergence of plants and animals. Plants and animals which are excitable cells. Excitability, which is something that very few minerals exhibit. There are a few minerals that are excited by electricity, that are excited by pressure, that are excited by temperature. But they, they, they are dwarfed by the sensitivity and excitability of even the most humble bacteria. Bacteria can already detect gradients or a, 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 a gradients of nutrients and swim towards them or gradients of toxics and swim away from them. They can become excited. They have become capable of responding and sensing the world. And with that emergence, with emergence of sensibility, we now have a more complex form of expressivity. In another chapter of that book called The Refrain, in which Deleuze and Guattari do their, basically their theory of music. It's a very important chapter for musicians to read, because they indu indeed do the history of classical music and show how it becomes more and more cosmic until it gets to Schoenberg and beyond. They play special emphasis on another break that takes place once living creatures have arise, the emergence of territoriality, the emergence of territorial animals, because in territorial animals, fingerprints which, as I said, are, belong to even the humblest form of matter, becomes signature. With a territorial animal, something that used to be a material flow, and I'm going to talk right now about the simplest form of territorial markings. The simplest form of territorial markings are when you transform feces and urine, which is to be part of the flow in a food chain, into a symbolic marker for a territory. A dog marks its territory with urine. A wolf marks its territory with feces. The, the, something, odors, which used to be a kind of byproduct of a digestive process, have now become a signature. From here on, my territory begins. This belongs to me. I'm prepared to defend this territory. Don't cross this territory. You don't need words for animals to be able to mark their territories that way. And with territorial behavior, a new line of expression can become detached. Let me give you some examples. In many animals, not only feces and urine become territorial markers, but also the colors of their skin. Fishes who are territorial have undergo hormonal changes, and if they are a very pale orange, they become a very bright orange the moment it comes to fight other fishes for their territory. Those changes, though, are still mediated internally. The animal is not choosing to express itself. Color is one means of expressivity. But, for instance, let me give you an example of how color can then migrate from the skin, in which it is genetically determined, to being now chosen by the bird. There is a particular species of bird called bowerbird, which, in order to seduce a female, needs to build a nest, needs to build an architectural structure. There are several species of bower birds. One species has a very bright blue plumage, I mean a, 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 a chromium blue that is it's almost impossible to miss. It's so attractive as far as his, his, his feathers are concerned that he builds a relatively simple nest for the female. I mean he's very confident that the female is going to come to him because of its bright colors. Then you have another species of bower bird in which only a few feathers have become are blue, everything else is kind of brown, and for the same reason, his nest now has to become much more complicated. When you look at the nests of the fully blue bird 
and the, and the bird that has lost some of the blue from its plumage, the second bird builds a much more magnificent structure. It is now beginning to express himself due to the lack of internal expressivity. Finally, there are bower birds who have lost completely all the blue color in their feathers. Now they don't only build a magnificent nest that is much better than the other two nests, he actually goes and picks up little blue ribbons, little blue bottle caps that are blue, little tiny blue pieces of paper, and decorates his nest with blue objects. Oh. Now, the list. <laughs> and then I shot the bird. <laughs> Deleuze sees in the bower bird an example of how expressivity by itself migrates from the skin slowly to the work of art, to the, to, to the nest in which now the blue is not genetically determined, the blue is found by the bird deliberately because it knows that it has lost that blue expressivity in its own body. But for the same reason, the bird has become an artist. A simple artist, but an artist. Song is another way in which birds express themselves. Birds, of course, can go from mere chirpings to repetitions of a single motif, which are relatively boring. In all cases, they are trying, of course, to express their identity. They're expressing their identity as owners of a territory, but they're also expressing their identity as members of a species to the female of the species. Any song can do that. But there are a few birds which, just like the naked or, or, or drab uh, bower bird, go beyond just expressing something, expressing ownership of territory, and begin, in a way, singing the praises of life. These are birds like the nightingale or the blackbird. The nightingale and the blackbird sing an incredibly elaborate song that never repeats itself. They need to learn to sing. It's a skill that the birds learn. It doesn't come in their genes. If you take a baby, bower, a baby uh, 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 blackbird and put it in a box so that you cannot hear the adult song, it comes out fully grown, singing a few notes that you can identify as the song of the species, but none of the flourishes, none of the style, and so on. Deleuze says that with the, advent of ba with the advent of blackbirds and nightingales, signature, the signature with which we mark our territory, has become style. And have become style because, because these birds, in order to differentiate themselves from each other and in order to seduce females, need now to create their own type of song. Oliver Messiaen, which is a, a musical composer, religious, composer of organ music and piano music of mid 20th century, one of the great masters of classical music in the 20th century, said himself, as a composer and as a musician, nightingales and blackbirds are artists. They have style. Art was not born with human beings. And that type of idea is what excites Deleuze is not only are making ourselves capable of being affected by bird song, not only uh, uh, making ourselves capable of being affected by bird, fish, and other colors, but not only being, allowing ourselves to be affected by the expressivity of three-dimensional shapes, geological shapes, but also to recognize that we are not the only ones in this planet that can invent new expressions. Certain birds can also do it. And when the first humans were beginning to draw paintings in their caves and were beginning to mark themselves with tattoos and were perhaps beginning to express their grief with certain moans and sounds, they were already surrounded by a world in which every single item in that world was singing the praises of life.
So Deleuze wants us to become animals, or wants us to engage in animal becomings, not in the sense of imitating animals, not in the sense of playing an animal in a, in a, on stage, but in the sense of truly identifying with all those with, with all that non-human expression as if it was a raw material for our works of art. Now, of course, we can use also human expressivity in our works of art. Humans express many things that animals don't express. Think, for instance, of solidarity in a community. Solidarity in a community can be expressed, of course, by words. You, I can say to members of my community, I love you people, I'm with you 100%. But solidarity in a community is expressed much more by actions, helping others on an everyday basis, showing up at the soup kitchen when there's a, when there's a strike and the workers need you there. Actions speak louder than words. And Deleuze was very aware that the expressivity of behavior, the expressivity of what you do, transcended and went beyond anything that we can say with words. In fact, for Deleuze, as for me, as many others, Talk is cheap. You can say anything you want to, but what matters is what you do and the way you express your solidarity in a community or your solidarity with a community of artists or solidarity with a community or in, a, in a demonstration for political rights by being there and by acting in a coherent way. He also talked about expressions of legitimacy. Expressions of legitimacy can, of course, vary in, a, in, in, in all kinds of ways, whether it's the legitimacy of a nation state, in which case it becomes flags, anthems, marchings, and so on, the, the legitimacy of a religion, in which it becomes elaborate ceremonies and rituals full of color and smell of incense, and, and, uh, and you know, uh, song and color. And we can, as artists, of course, also take legitimacy, solidarity, and other forms of human expression as our raw materials. But what is important for Deleuze is that we do not draw a sharp line between the two, that we see a continuum, that we see in those expressions also praises of life, and that we learn to hate those expressions, for instance, of militarism, or those expressions of hatred, ethnic hatred, or those expressions which deny life. We do not have, which do not affirm life. Now there's another way of tackling the question of expressivity, and let me just try to keep myself in time here. There, was, there is a, an important psychologist of animal perception, his name is James, James Gibson. I'm not sure that the list was ever familiar with him. James Gibson was very interested in knowing how animals perceive their environment and how animals perceive their ecosystems. And he invented the word affordance. It's a neologism. But what it means is this. The opportunities and risks that the environment, whether it's geological or biological, the opportunities and risks that the environment affords an animal or supplies an animal with or provides an animal with. For instance, a piece of solid ground affords an animal a surface to walk. And an animal doesn't need to have the concept walking on ground to know in its muscular intelligence that the ground is supplying it with a surface to walk. The moment the animal reaches the edge of a lake and sees that its paws sink, it knows that the lake doesn't afford it, doesn't supply it with a surface to walk. So James Gibson, what he's trying to tell us is the environment expresses its capacities to affect us and to be affected by us. And animals come to perceive those expressions. A cluttered environment full of rocks and so on affords an animal a walking opportunity, but only in some directions. A cliff affords an animal risk, the risk of falling down. And those rocks down there, those pointy rocks down on the cliff, afford an animal the risk of piercing its flesh. All of the environment is expressing the opportunities and risks that is offering an animal. Normal animals walk not at the edge of a cliff. They know they afford a risk. They walk a safe distance because they are, they are, they are queued up to the expressivities of their environment. 
a hole of the right size on the sides of a mountain affords a running rabbit a place to hide. But it may also afford a fox a place to hide in order not to be seen by the rabbit and to catch it, you know, by surprise. The, rat, the fox itself affords danger to the rabbit, and the rabbit itself affords an oppor a nutritional opportunity to the fox. Affordances, of course, can also be social. The, the, the architecture itself is all, in a way, about those surface layouts which express to the users the opportunities and risks that a particular building supplies them with. Solid walls afford me an obstacle, but also afford me privacy from onlookers outside. A door affords me passage. A hallway affords me connectivity to go to other rooms. It's almost as if architects had learned from natural environments to construct surface layouts that immediately express to a human user the, the potentialities for action that that particular surface layout, that particular structure space supplies me with. So when James Gibson is talking to us about seeing affordances directly, about how animal perception is directly queued up to what the environment expresses, what he's basically telling us is that we are all surrounded by, by, by this non-human expressivity and that our very actions are indeed uh, adapted to that non-human expressivity. Another thing that Deleuze touches on a lot, because again, he's trying to get away from verbal expression. Verbal expression is indeed very important, and particularly when it's done by poets or by novelists. Routine verbal expression tends to become almost boring, but you can inject energy into language to make it much more expressive. But what, what the Lucis Trino tells us is, yes, of course we can do that. But there are many other ways in which we can express ourselves without language. And so he tries to then focus on different aspects of the human body and different, different aspects of human behavior. For instance, he concentrates a lot on the human face. The human face is one of those very poorly studied entities. It's 30 or 40 or so muscles capable of about 1,000 to 2,000 different expressions, from regular expressions of sadness, fear, joy, to, to gross uh, expressions that I can just, you know, that, that are allowed and, and that allow you to express even feelings that may not even be the natural feelings of humanity. The human face, according to the list, stabilizes language. Language, we can get a, away with a lot of ambiguities in language because we are stabilizing the meaning of our words with our faces. In a conversation, for instance, we must be facing one another because, of course, it is the face that it is, that it is relating every member of the conversation in addition to the words. If one member of the conversation becomes scared and all of a sudden there's an expression of fear in his face, everybody else turns around to see what that person is seeing because the very ex expression of fear in the face is already expressing a possible world. No one can see right now what I am being afraid of, but my face with that dramatic gesture has expressed everything without expressing, without utilizing a single word. The hands. Italians are, of course, masters of expressivity with their hands. They move in, in an almost operatic way, and they inject expressivity into their, into their already very expressive language by movements of the hands and by, by, by the kind of choreography of, 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 the, of the hands that they, as a culture, apparently have developed up to the optimal point. The body. The body is typically included in our theories as the kind of token material entity. Everything is text, everything is language, everything is metaphor, but then there is the body. But of course, choreographers know that you can make an incredibly expressive use of the body without using a single word.
is capable of an incredible number of positions, and this we inherit too from animals. Animals, for instance, change, and I'm talking right now about vertebrate animals in particular. Vertebrate animals have different gates. A horse, for instance, can switch from walking in a very elegant way to trotting and then express a different type of movement and then break into a gallop and express a much more dynamic type of movement simply by having changed the types of muscles and bones that are he's using and the symmetry of the four legs with respect to one another. We are also capable of different gates, but we are capable of much more than that. So, to Deleuze, it was sad that the last three or four decades of the 20th century, indeed everything beginning with a linguistic turn in the 1930s, had, had completely drawn our attention away from the physicality of expression, from color, from odor, from sound, to language. In his book on Kafka, for instance, he's constantly comparing the, the letters or the written texts that characters deal with, with the raw sounds that they hear from the street, with the raw sounds of, of uh, that character that wakes up as, a, as, a, as, as an insect in his bed, with, with the feelings of being an insect in the bed, with the preoccupation that, that he had that his sister was going to see it in that animal form, but at the same time exploiting to the full the, the idea that once you become a bug, once you wake up as a bug in your bed, your repertoire of expression has been limited now and has changed, and now all you can emit is these raw sounds that nevertheless are expressive and dramatic. And he's constantly, in his book on Kafka, drawing our attentions to pure intensities, to pure intensities of color, pure intensities of sound, pure intensities of texture, pure intensities of odor. Precisely the kinds of intensities that pass or beyond a certain threshold overcome us and make us respond with crying, make us respond with, with just gut-level reactions that we later on say, I don't have words to express what I was feeling at that moment. Dreams, of course, are another one of our favorite expressive moments. One of I uh, remember when I was a filmmaker, and of course as a filmmaker you have to worry about not only the aspects of expression, but the industrial component of film, which is all this expensive equipment, and whether you're getting the right frame and the right lighting and all that, and how much money you're spending. So I remember I became very used to uh, checking my shots and checking that everything was lit just perfectly. And I had a series of dreams a, at the time, you know, one of those lucid dreams when you realize you have a dream. And uh, normally when I have a lucid dream and I realize I, I'm, I'm in a dream, I try to do something illegal. I try to do something that I would not be able to do if this was not a dream. But in this series, what I wanted to do, I just, in, just, just kind of spontaneously, I wanted to check the production values of the dream. I just wanted to check <laughs> how much money they spend on the sets, how many extras they hire. Because, you know, I understand that there's other approach to dreams in which what you try to understand is to what extent certain aspects of the dream stand for your father or stand for your mother and what, in what way Oedipus complex is being reenacted in the dream. I had absolutely no interest in that. What I wanted to know is how expressive are the sets? So I remember the first dream I was facing, uh, I was in the, in, uh, at the door of a bedroom and there was a big brass bed with those tubular uh, brass uh, uh, endings and their balls, that look like a big ball at the end. And I knew, you know, I thought, well, if this is really, if they have the budget to do this, there must be a fish eye reflection of the room on that ball. And I could see it from far away, so in my dream I walk closer, I look at the ball and there it was. A fisheye reflection of the entire room. I was, bravo, master. In another, in another dream I ran to try to see if they could reproduce the feeling of air in my face. And there was the feeling of air in my face. I then tried to check out, I was in a big hotel, how many extras they had hired to fool me. 
So I try to focus on many different layers of the hotel to see how far away they had higher extras and there they were, little silhouettes with the little suitcases coming to register at the hotel. And you know, there were, must have been about 3,000 people of different sizes. And I'm going, wow! I mean, really, the director and producer of my dreams, <laughs> they really have a big budget. <laughs> but beyond the joke, dreams are extremely expressive. I mean, it shows us just how expressive our minds can be. You can have a silent dream with a, without a single word. And the, the drama, the plot, the characters are incredibly expressive. Of course, those are also sources in which we can draw from. You know, it, 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 Deleuze calls dreams larval thought. Almost as if we had gone back into our embryological self and had liberated our minds from the adult frame in which, you know, everything has to make sense and everything has to be in its right place and everything has to be practical and pragmatic. And every night we became lar... we became like... Um, fetuses again, and our mind became flexible and stretchable and moldable. And to him, that was a kind of becoming animal. Not necessarily because animals have dreams, but because during, in the dream state, the, 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 the constraining aspects of civilization and the constraining aspects of social behavior cease to, cease to operate and an entire drama is staged for us, in which we sometimes are the central characters, some of the times we're just peripheral characters. So, when Deleuze recommends that we attempt to become, that we attempt to break from our human uh, straitjacket, it simply is not a matter of uh, despising humanity, because there, there is an aspect of humanity that does praise life, that is life affirming. It is just a matter of not letting our humanity, not letting our pride of being humans get in the way of admiring the expressivity of other things. To, it, he wants us to learn from the world itself. This is why Deleuze, part, or is part of the reason why Deleuze is a realist, why he doesn't think that we create the world with our classifications, because he, he, he believes that the world is capable of self-organization, that form doesn't need us to project our signifiers to be born, that the world is not an amorphous flow, as idealists sometimes believe, that needs to be cut out by signifiers to be given form, but that the world can have form on its own. In a way, by doing this, and let me take my jacket off, what he's... <laughs> you haven't even seen flex my muscles. <laughs> right, to express strength. <laughs> what he's warning us is basically this. When one believes in creationism, and one believes that God gave form to the world, what one is basically saying is that matter is an inert receptacle for forms that come from the outside. Ma matter, needs, matter is obedient, and therefore it, be, it needs to be given commands. God needs to come in and say, let there be light, because of course matter by itself would not be able to shine. God needs to come in and say, let there be animals and plants, because of course matter itself would not be able to generate animal and plant life. God needs to come in and say, let there be this, let there be that, and command matter into producing something. Deleuze wants us to think of matter as morphogenetically pregnant. Morphogenesis, the birth of form, has been always tied up to some psychic agency, or at least in the case of Plato, to some transcendental reservoir of essences the essence of sphericity, the essence of crystallicity, that then give form to this inert material that obviously is incapable of expressing itself. But Deleuze wants us to think the other way. It's like eliminate everything that's transcendental. Matter has immanent 
powers of morphogenesis. Matter, an immanent basically means precisely that it doesn't receive those powers from somewhere else, from some other space. That matter is in itself capable of generating form. And so the entire theory of morphogenesis is, is one of the subjects that a lot of French theorists from Henri Poincaré at the turn of the century to Henri Bergson, then René Thom and Mandelbrot, the inventor of fractals in the 1960s. Many French people, and this was in the air in the 60s when Deleuze began writing his books on morphogenesis, difference and repetition and logic of sense, have become a, a seduced by these new conceptions of matter. And, and have found in, a, in, in this respect of material morphogenesis a source of inspiration and, and, and uh, for artistic creativity. Today, of course, we know a lot more about process of morphogenesis, both the morphogenesis of, say, thunderstorms and tornadoes, and then the morphogenesis, of the, the, the incredibly complex process that transforms a fertilized egg into a bunch of cells which then by themselves begin migrating and becoming bone or migrating outwards and becoming muscle. Certain cells that come together pulsating and eventually become a heart. They, and, and, and how slowly and without any psychic divine intervention a single cell can indeed become a baby. But he, but he says the moment is crucial is the moment right before all those organs have formed, that is the moment in which the fetus is still what he calls a body without organs. The concept of a body without organs is precisely that. Matter inhabited by pure intensities, capable without any prior organization, without any prior biological, physical, or even chemical organization to express itself. A good example of a body without organs, once I gave my students the other day, imagine those maps that you see every night on, a, on, on your meteorology, on the weather report, in which you see not the coastlines and the areas of, of, you know, the territories and the territorialized part of the earth, which is, of course, the different countries with their different coastlines and so on, but simply the highs and lows of pressure, the warm fronts and cold fronts of temperature, the masses of air moving at one speed and moving, uh, one, some moving at a, small, a slower speed, some moving at a faster speed. Temperature, pressure, speed are expressive intensities. We, of course, feel them. We can feel a very hot, warm summer day in which the humidity is very intense and very concentrated. And we can also feel a crisp, fall day in which there's not a single drop of water and the temperature is just right. But regardless of there being humans there to feel and interpret and enjoy these moments, the very existence of intensive differences causes things to be born, causes morphogenesis. It is from the clashes between those highs and lows of pressure, between those warm fronts and those cold fronts, between those slow masses of air and those rapid masses of air, that every single Phenomenon in the atmosphere is born from hurricanes and tornadoes to clouds, a, a wind currents like the jet stream, and so on. And he traces that world of differences, the world of expressive differences to the fetus, because it's also the, the, the fetus also develops through different concentrations of chemicals, different densities of temperature and pressure within the, the development, the developing embryo and the migrate, migrating cells that become bone, the migrating cells that eventually become a brain, the migrating cells that, that, that eventually take a limb and, and get fingers out of it, all of those are following differences in intensity. That's why that process can proceed spontaneously without the need for some psychic agency to guide it. It is his admiration for the creativity, the spontaneous creativity of matter, the capacities of matter for self-organization, that pulls him away from the human. He could have stayed just a pure human philosopher and, 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 and feel proud of his tradition and be connected to other philosophers and just feel human all to human. But he went out there in search of Spinoza, he went out there in search of Nietzsche, he went out there in search of 
all those nomad philosophers who refuse to belong to humanity, who refuse to say, all I am is human. I want to be a rock. I want to be a mountain. I want to be air circulating. I want to be a bird singing. He wanted to follow and to find those philosophers, and he did. Well, Spinoza, Nietzsche, some of the scholastics, even some pre-Socratic philosophers had had those feelings, had had those emotions, had enjoyed and allowed those emotions to well up in themselves by confronting this non-human expressivity in nature. So when Deleuze then recommends that we engage in becomings, that we, that we leave behind our, the straight jacket of our humanity, he's not necessarily denying that we also need that humanity in order to fight political fights or in order to intervene in reality to, to obtain some rights from the government. That sometimes we may need to be humans in order to get certain conditions for, the, for, for humans that are better than what we were before. It's just that he says, do not spend all your time being human. Your dreams are already a larval form of thought. You are already every night being forced to become non-human. Now try to bring that which happens spontaneously in your brain every night, that morphogenesis of the dream. Remember that to Deleuze, dreams were not edible. Doesn't matter what Freud said, he denied that they were edible. He denied that that tunnel is a vagina and that train is a penis or this stands for my daddy and this starts for my mommy. What he wanted to know is, is be completely amazed at the fact that every night you have a different dream, that the plots change, that the characters change, that your brain is filled with morphogenesis spontaneously since you're obviously not directing what dreams, ha what dreams you have and you're simply caught in that, in that uh, in that storm that is your dreams every night, your brain is capable of that. Your brain has, has a, a, a gotten that cap capability from the matter that it is made out of. And, it, and it, we share that capability with every material object. So don't just, don't just use your dreams as, as a source of inspiration. Use every process of morphogenesis out there as a source of inspiration in order to join that giant chorus of birds singing, of birds displaying their colors, of birds using silhouette and position and posture to express themselves, join that giant chorus in a, in, in a praising of life, in an affirmation of life. Thank you very much.